and I can say, well, either the flying spaghetti monster exists or the flying spaghetti monster doesn't exist, which is one of the, is the church the flying spaghetti monster if you don't know that. But I'll take the proponents of evidence that actually uh, points to, uh, in, in a rational argument, I'll say, okay, let's take the one with Iraq. Somehow they felt that uh, basically 1,300, 1,300 years of warfare was something they could solve diplomatically. That to me was just irrational. It's, all the evidence was, hey, then, you know, I mean, look at now, they're still looking at severed heads and bodies. It's the same thing that was happening in the seventh century. And I would say that was not a very rational position, Gandhi. But they had people that said, well, we have all this to solve it. In fact, it's interesting, and I'd like your spin on this, is that I did say, I think you can be rational and evil. I have no doubt that that could apply to someone like Himmler or Hitler. You can be rational and evil. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, and, and the, the problem is, I would argue, that one of the ways in which evil manifests itself is that I'm willing to use my rationality not to seek truth, but to defend my evil. And, and that, that's the problem. That's why rationality alone is not really the issue. The issue is ultimately the, the disposition of my inner being toward goodness, and, and I would argue toward God, but, but certainly toward goodness. That's a far more fundamental issue than whether I'm being rational. Rational it, reason is just the tool that I use to, as I said, to try to make contact with reality and to come to terms with what that is. But what I do with it is another issue. Uh, one of the things that I think would be useful for us to talk about is this, this question of truth, uh, because you used it a lot. And for me, I'm sort of a Richie, Richard Rorty pragmatist, and Richard Rorty says that, you know, he'd really like it if for the next 10 years, philosophy departments stop talking about truth, because they don't know what it's about. And my definition of truth is borrowed from Parker Palmer. He says that truth is an unending dialogue about things that matter, conducted with passion and discipline. I don't view that there's truth with the capital T. I think that's, like I said, that that's one of the things that Plato, to paraphrase Flannery O'Connor at the end of A Good Man is Hard to Find, it would have been better if Plato had been taken out once a day in his backyard and shot, he might have turned into something. <laughs> and I think this whole question of that there's truth and then there's appearance and all that kind of stuff. So how do you define truth? With a capital T, little t, both? Yeah, with a capital T. I'm old fashioned enough to believe that there really is, that truth is simply. Um, if, if I have discovered something about objective reality that actually matches reality the way that it is, then that is true. And truth with a capital T would be having all my beliefs match reality the way it really is. It's one thing to believe that truth with a capital T exists. It's another thing to believe that I have it, and that's an entirely different matter. Um, that can be evil and dangerous, but I, I just don't, it seems to me, I mean, I, it seems to me that covertly, people like you do believe in truth with the capital T in the way that I do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Although I think you would have fit in real well if my seminarians talking about farting. I think you would have heard it because you have the same kind of mind. Say, yeah, you know, that's what it is. No, I don't accept that there's truth with the capital T. I mean, it's a process. And, uh, it's a well, I would agree that it's a process. I mean, that's not that. That the process of discovering truth and arriving at truth and coming to our truth, we can only approximate it increasingly, hopefully, as we enter into that dialogue and with openness and passion. I, I, I have no problem with that. But to define that as truth is another issue. I mean, if we don't define that as truth, where are we going in this dialogue? What are we aiming for? Uh, if we're just aiming at a consensus, that consensus can wander anywhere into all those evils that you've been talking about. And I think that's really... Um, the hard part, because one of the questions that comes out of this is, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of my life? What is the purpose of it? Um, I think, in fact, with Pascal, um, when he was working on his wager, he had just come into a world where Copernicus had shown that not only was the planet of Earth not the center of the universe, it wasn't even the planet, the center of our solar system. And I was walking the other day, wondering what that would be like. You had such certainty. I'm home. This is home. And all of a sudden, they have that ripped out from underneath you. He was one of the first people that I know of in writing who wrote, why am I here? For me, I think it's the wrong question. Um, I really do. You know, what does it mean? Uh, 
Joseph Campbell, I like his definition. He says people aren't looking for meaning, they're looking uh, to be involved in something so passionately that they feel the rapture of what's, what's to be alive. And one of my favorite philosophers, Campbell, big surprise, uh, wrote that, uh, first of all, you have to love life. If you don't love life, no meaning will console you. And I think that's sort of how I would answer the question of truth. You've got to find ways to love your life, love what you're doing. Now, this is pretty anecdotal and irrational, but I know that some of the happiest people I know are people who have volunteered to help other people. Somehow, that gives them an answer to the question of meaning, but it certainly makes them happy. I don't know if that answers the question about meaning, but I think that's, we were talking about the meaning, that's my purpose, what am I here for? <laughs> I remember once going to a shaman workshop, and this guy was saying, I get people coming in, yuppies all the time in midlife crisis, saying, what's my purpose in life? And he says, well, that's a dumb question. You know, if you were living about 400 years ago and you were in, like, Greenland, your purpose in life would be, you have to hunt and kill reindeer. If you don't, you would die. What was Hildegard's purpose in life? To provide heirs. That caused a whole bunch of problems, but that was her job, was to do this too much. So I'm not sure that, and I understand, I think we're in the same place, that I spent way too much of my life looking for the thing. And, uh, and so to say, hey, this is cool, this life thing is cool. She's pretty, he's not. I mean, all the things that go in the life, oh, that's interesting. You know, it's like dub bars. We spend a lot of time talking about Augustine and others in that tradition, where faith trumped reason. Uh, I I just want to make it clear that that's not that's not my position. Reason always trumps faith. I mean, faith is really just I think the product of culture. It's a way of saying uh, we want you to conform to our worldview, our set of beliefs, our doctrines, our perspective, our practices. We want you to conform to that. And don't think about it too hard because you might decide that it doesn't really make any sense to conform to it, so accept it by faith. And it, and it becomes, I think you're right, it becomes sort of a political tool um, for, for enforcing that kind of conformity. But that's, that's not the conception of faith that I would defend. Could you speak up? I'm sorry. Okay. That's not the conception. Oh, away from you farther. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the rational position with it. <laughs> That's not the conception of faith that I would defend. Uh, I want to sort of mention too that that uh, one of the def that the primary definition of faith since even the Torah before the time of Augustine in terms of of uh, society. So there's two definitions of faith. And the one that operates even more now is loyalty or trust, as in Semper Fi. It doesn't have to do with faith. It has to do with loyalty and trust. And the other one, a faith is defined within sometimes a religious context. I guess that, you know, when I was talking about whether faith trumps reason, um, because you used the word trump, I forget what that was. You had faith trumps reason. I'm not sure. But you talk about the fact that sometimes you can know things intuitively or however that reason cannot address. How, does, how is that different from saying that faith trumps reason? Well, very simply, because you take the way Augustine looked at things. He says you can't have God for a father unless you have a church for mother. It's other um, that his relationship with God needed to be mediated by this institution, and I would argue even more largely by a certain culture that got established there, and that was mediating his relationship with God. Well, and that's how he's looking at faith. It's loyalty to that culture. I, I am granting that rationality is not merely what I consciously understand, consciously know, consciously believe, uh, come being influenced by Pauline. I believe there's a tacit dimension to rationality. So a lot of what we know and a lot, a lot of what we believe is very unconscious and inarticulate. I don't have any problem with that, but I don't think that's out of the, out of the domain of what makes rationality rationality. And I, I think we need to trust that and, and rely on that more than we do and acknowledge that more than we do. But I wouldn't call that faith. It's rationality. Bar.
Okay, so open for audience questions. Uh, you, sir, over there on the right. Best. Neither of you dis have discussed the role of presuppositions in your thinking. Your example of uh, consensus and Darwinism led to the British marching through New Zealand, murdering every non-British person they saw, and cleansing the island of the Maori inhabitants. That was a consensus, because their presupposition was that God had not yet made them human. I don't remember that. You just talked about Darwin? I talked, I, I talked about evolution. Right. One of the interesting things about New Zealand, where I've lived, too, was that the Maori are very proud of their heritage, and they talk about you know, cannibalism. But one of the things they can't accept is that they became cannibals because they ate everything on the island, and all that was left was people. They ate all the animals. I'm not sure that 